Now, the scary part about that is that's unknown. And making the change is hard because you don't know who you're going to be on the other side of that thing. This is why people stay in relationships that they don't love. This is why people cultivate careers that they're not passionate about. And this is why people get bitter and twisted over time is because they're more comfortable with the hell that they know than the heaven that's slightly uncertain. Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Building Men Podcast. Become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Brother, what's up? You're going to switch it over so they yeah, can see me? Right. We just talked about we that. We just talked about blew this. It. He there already messed it up. I can't believe it. I'm sitting here with my thumb <laughs> up my ass and here just the well -oiled just want everyone to look how... at me all the time. <laughs> welcome to the Dennis Show. Here's about Dennis. As always. Yep. Yeah. So how are you doing? How's it going? I'm doing great. I Love feel like a million bucks. Building men gear, you're rocking out. I know, dude. The Camel shirts, hat. they really fit so good. So you like this, or I was I was on the the beach yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. And um, not that this has anything to do with it, and you know, no disrespect or whatever. But so there's an Asian family next to us on the beach, right? Okay. And so now the thing is, we're on um in <laughs> we're in Bethany Beach, right? And they there's a tent set up on the beach. Okay. You know, like now, you know, people have the umbrellas and this and that. Which let me tell you this fun fact. Almost 33,000 people have been injured by flying umbrellas on the beach. Wow. And one lady was actually killed being impaled by an umbrella because it was windy yesterday. And these fucking umbrellas are flying all over the place. That's how I want to go out. Right. <laughs> That's Impalement a great story beach umbrella. We had a discussion. Are more people killed by sharks or flying umbrellas on the beach? That's it's sharks, but it was a, it was a, a little it bit was of sharks? a debate. It was sharks. More people are injured by umbrellas but killed by sharks. See, that's a let's it's post a that on fun fact on Write that uh, down for the next podcast. podcast so well, anyway so there's rather a, be killed by I, I shouldn't say it was it was a family i won't even you know okay there was a family next to us and they have this tent set up like a tent you'd, you'd have at a party mm -hmm. that's an, a thing now that people are putting up these pop-up tents on the beach so there's a pop-up tent on the beach and now they have an umbrella that was you know staked into the ground mm -hmm. and umbrellas there's a, a couple different layers of how they make these umbrellas they're like the good old-fashioned hardcore umbrellas now there's these like plastic cheap shit umbrellas mm -hmm. And first their tent goes flying, the whole tent, and they have to, like, redo it or whatever. The whole family comes out and helps them get it, you know, get it together. And then all of a sudden, like, we see this umbrella is about to go. So I walk over, and I was like, I grab the umbrella, I take it out of the ground, and I, un like, I take it down. And they're like, excuse me, what are you doing? I said, you're going to kill someone. You're literally, there's going to be someone that dies, and I'm not going to let it happen. And so I had this moment where I feel like I saved you see, I could potentially save the life with me doing this. Umbrella. So wait, we got to back up. Explain to me why it was significant to let us know that they were an Asian family. That's what I want to know. <laughs> it just said they just were. <laughs> okay, I just I'm sorry. I was gonna do a voice. Oh there. God, don't do that. To, I, we were not I allowed to do that. One. So, no. um, <laughs> I don't know how we got there, but I wanted to int introduce our guest just to break the ice a little bit here. And we haven't talked in a while, so I no, wanted we to haven't. tell you the story about the Thanks. beach yesterday. So anyway, the moral of that story is... They, if you uh, see an umbrella, take it down. Rolling, ro rogue umbrellas can kill us. There should be some level of accountability. You should have to pass a course to stake an umbrella in the ground before you're on the beach because that, that it won't affect you. It will affect the motherfuckers down the beach yeah. with this flying umbrella. Yeah, yeah. All right. They I'm should. no hero. I'm no, I'm no Listen, hero. I, but they I, don't I, always <laughs> wear capes, though, brother. I'm just saying. <laughs> Speaking of, of heroes, I wanted to introduce our, our guest today, um, and, and the whole um, the T-shirt the that he's wearing is just fortitude strength. I just I, It resonated with me as a big uh, Marvel and Captain America fan. Our guest today on the Building Man podcast is Cody Ringel. He is, um, he is the founder and the owner of Fortitude Strength and CrossFit Angola. He is a coach. He is a uh, level three certified and lifted coach, a program that we are about to start uh, pretty soon. So Cody Ringel, thanks so much for being on the Building Man podcast, my friend. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. 
Thanks for putting up with the nonsense that we just started the, the podcast with right there. Yeah. Uh, the so. more uh, the more details that you can add to a story, the more uh, realistic it becomes. So that must be why uh, there we go. why you had to add the anecdote about the family. <laughs> yeah, I get it. And Paint insert any any nationality and right, ethnicity right there. Difference. It's still I know. See what's funny, Cody, is that <laughs> if you weren't that conversation, that would be our podcast, except that would go on for forty five minutes. So. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I get it. Hundred percent. That would have been what people need to hear, though. (laughs) And to the the fortitude, strength. uh, You have the Captain America um, signal. What a great idea! Do you have to pay any royalties to to Marvel for that, or are you just like fuck it? um, We're just going to do what we're going to do. I think it's uh, different enough, and I'm not entirely sure how, but it's different enough that no, I don't, and it's likely because it's a slide under the radar thing. So I just called it right out there for yeah. everyone. I'm going to get I'm going to get the a cease and, cease and desist order next yep. week. You're welcome. But listen, that's one of those yeah. things where like, you know, even bad publicity is good publicity. Sure. So at least people are like, "Wow, let me find out more about this fortitude strength. This is yeah. fucking badass." <laughs> it's such a cool logo. Well, I'm such a like big fan of it. Thank you. So we got to know we each other that. for a, a couple minutes before hitting record here and you had mentioned that you um, you talked about your you were a mediocre high school athlete. I wanted to start there. Um, both Anthony and I played high school sports. Anthony um, played baseball and football. I played basketball and and baseball. And um, right, I said baseball and football for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and both of us had our individual sport. Anthony's was football. Mine was baseball. And we both went on to play college sports. So we know what goes into that the, the process of being a, a high school athlete. So take us back to that point in your life. I'm I'm fascinated with you had mentioned you weren't you were you were a mediocre athlete, but you were a hard worker. Where do you think that that came from? Where you were like, you know what, you you had this this ability, the, you know, this athletic ability. But it was this like grit determination that helped you go on to play college sports. A couple of places. One, it was modeled uh, by my mom for sure. So she was uh, a single mother. Our parents, uh, my my parents had two cohorts of kids, right? So they were both married before they found each other, got married, subsequently got divorced. Uh, so I have three brothers and three sisters. Uh, like you guys, how there's that gap in age, uh, in between my mom's group of kids and myself and my little brother, uh, who are the only ones, he's the only one who shares the same mother father with me. There's 12 years there. And then from her oldest to youngest, there's 20 years. So my oldest sister is 48, my youngest or 47. My youngest brother is 27. So there's a span there. Um, she and my father split up when I was about two, two and a half, got divorced finally when I was four and a half, five. Um, and she worked in a factory for almost her entire adult life. Factory work, um, is the factory she worked at, they produced hot dogs. So it was 60, 65 hours a week in 35 degree, like pretty much a freezer. I worked there for a summer uh, in between high school and college, and uh, it gave me a great level of appreciation for the kind of work that she did for 27 years. Her main motivator was to provide for her family. This was the best way that she knew how. And even at 65 hours a week, most of the year, she was less than, you know, maybe a $40,000 a year on a great year. Tough work. So I got to see that the other thing that was a huge motivator for me was, uh, and this is something that I still carry today is a fear of mediocrity. So I believe that we all need a heaven to run towards and a hell to run away from. My hell is average. It's just good enough to get by and not be known for anything, recognized for anything. And some people love that and I get it. Like they just want life to be as good as it can be. I think that sucks. So once I started doing the things, I started playing the sports. I, my freshman year, um, I played, you know, when I was younger, I played soccer and basketball. Uh, and I eventually quit the basketball team because I started to, I was a chunky kid. Started to get pretty hot. I wore huskies 
Husky that gives you an yeah. indicator. Yep. The Husky section. Oh yeah. So, uh, started, we, I remember one day we had a, uh, we had practice and it was five on five shirts versus skins. I was lucky enough to be picked to be skins. I was tormented relentlessly by, uh, by one kid so much to the fact that, uh, the next day I, uh, I quit the team. I never played basketball again. I went out for the basketball team my freshman year and the baseball team my freshman year, and I got cut from both. I didn't even I got cut through tryouts. Football was the only sport that I showed up with at that I was uh, I was welcomed from the beginning. You know that creates the tribe, the brotherhood. They need bodies. You need bodies for the practice squad. You need bodies uh, to play the games. All of it. My football coach at the time told me that I should wrestle because wrestling would make me a better football player. So I wrestled. One of my other uh, older male teachers told me that I should come run for him. So for two years, for freshman and sophomore year, I ran the mile, the half mile, and the two mile relay. This is when I finally hit my growth spurt. I uh, saw a crazy change in the way that my body looked, felt, and performed. Showed up as a sophomore in high school and uh, I was an entirely different human being than I was freshman year for a lot of good reasons. You know, you finally hit your growth spurt. You finally start to mature. One of the other things that happened during my freshman year of high school was uh, I was dating this girl. So I was dating this girl and she started talking to another guy. And we all know what that's like. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And of course, as a, you know, 13, 14 year old, uh, that cannot be tolerated, right? You, now it's not just about me. It's about my reputation in a small school. I graduated with 87 kids. Yeah. That gives you any idea. It's a small town. So I let my mouth start writing checks that my ass couldn't cash. Uh, I eventually ended up meeting up with this kid in the hallway. I turned back to look at a buddy, uh, like I got this. And that's the last thing I remember before I woke up in the office with a towel over my face, which I pulled down and there was a quarter size hole in my face. Oh. Right here. What happened was apparently what happened was that as I turned back, I turned right back into his fist. He knocked one of my teeth out, put a big old hole in my face. So now I have this reputation as a freshman in high school of being a total bitch. I'm the guy who got his ass kicked in front of the entire school. Now I'm working to overcome that. So I start hitting the weight room pretty hard. I start trying to let my uh, performance on the field be the representation of how I'm remembered. I also became a relentless fucking asshole. Um, And I was just, I wasn't a good dude through most of that stage of my life. Get into college, start making, uh, you know, decisions in alignment with who I thought that I needed to be. And then, you know, we go from there. Let me start with the hot dog factory. Just as as a quick aside, I I have, I don't, I don't want to fail to, to make sure that I address this. You worked there for a summer. Yep. What the fuck is in a hot dog? Like what? what, what uh, like what are we talking about? Yeah. Here? Do we want to know first of all? And... I feel like I want to know right now. I mean, I'm like, right, I'm going on this go journey of discovery. Let's start there. So these particular hot dogs were all beef. Um, they were all beef. They were kosher. So they actually had rabbis okay. who worked there that had to bless the uh, bless the meat as oh, it was wow. being made. Yeah. So can an enlisted um, level three certification coach can you bless a hot dog? <laughs> I mean, I could. I don't think it makes it kosher, though. <laughs> well, you should. You should be. We, that should be part I of it. I agree. We got to talk to Mark we'll England about, we'll about that as well. It should be part of it, he, yeah. even if it's not kosher. It should be in lifted. Then something it happens. Should be an it's now an lifted hot dog. dog. <laughs> so that'll be our way. Yeah. So th- I, I needed to just address that. I just didn't. I wanted to make sure that we talked about the hot dogs. The next thing is, and it's so interesting. I never thought about that until right now, Cody, as you were talking. I grew up in that world. I don't know if you did, but the shirts versus skins. 
it's yeah i just went down this like this journey back into middle and high school where that was just the thing that's what you did it was just the way it was right and for me i went from um in middle school i was i was probably right before the husky section pre-husky i would say so from my eighth grade year i was probably five seven five eight one fifty something like that 155 then my freshman year i was six four 156 like i mm. shot up tremendously but i remember for me a lot of my friends in eighth grade had already hit puberty and so you know we had the kids with the deep voices and the kids that had hairy armpits and that was like a determining factor like you for me i remember being so anxious about playing shirts versus skins a lot of it was like the kids are going to see that i didn't hit puberty yet yeah that and i was so ashamed hairless body or you had to shower in yes, the bathrooms we too did. And, we had to, and football it's yes. the same freaking thing you had to shower and i was like there's these and you, like not that i'm like checking out people's fucking packages no but, but when like they when there's it. like kids are walking around with a with a like there looks like they have a like a troll doll on a like a leg lock. You notice that shit. You're like, holy god, my god, they're was, they got. I was waiting for what type of metaphor you're about to use right now because you. Were... I, I pulled it out of thin air. So, I, we went from the hot dog to this. So once for for like a kid to recognize like I am not that level or like there's something wrong with me, especially if you if you're a little bit overweight, it can be a traumatic experience for a kid, right? It's something that at the time. I know I didn't, I thought about it because I didn't hit puberty yet, but thinking back to all the kids, like in the shirts versus skins, how, like how horrible. For, and for that's why body that image shit. and especially for men too, we don't even think about it, usually just relate it to women, but men had that same issue all the time with their bodies, not feeling manly enough, strong enough, not having big enough muscles. And then as you were talking about with like the fighting, um, I looked at that was my way to be a man was to, especially in high school. It was like, well, how many fights you get in? Oh, did you fuck that kid up? Did you beat him up? Did you get your ass kicked? Like, so parties, I would go there and I would drink and I would just want to get into fights. And then that was a cool thing to do, right? You would, and that's what identified me as a man growing up was like, you know, sports, fighting, how strong you were and fuck. That's like a tough road to go down because again the trouble that you get into and just what that leads after that and you almost got to a point where correct me if i'm wrong you would go into parties and shit and be like who's gonna fucking punch me in the face like I'll oh i got kids yeah here. so i would tell kids i they would pay me to punch me in the face when i was at a party so like i would get and they would give me like five bucks and one kid knocked me out unconscious multiple i like probably three kids knocked me out where i was out cold at a party and then i get woken up with like a beer in my hand it was like oh cool huh aunt that was crazy and my eyes fucking black and blue my chin to the side i'm like for what you know and like i don't know i didn't even that's remember that i told time, you man. that you gotta like that's gonna be part of your training camp for the whole <sighs> journey i'm yeah. sure is just that experience that's so i think about you cody going through that you like you're right there's this kid and i'm gonna you you mentioned you were you said you were a bit of an asshole or whatever but you're standing up to someone and then all of a sudden the script is totally turned so you've i know i remember there were those times where you you stood up to the bully for me it took a while in my life but to stand up to the bully and then all of a sudden you know you're you're in this situation like where the worst nightmare out, comes true when and you stand you're up like to the man bully. i have to rewrite my script right now so i i don't want to like beat a dead horse with it or whatever but if you could talk to us just about as a high school kid you know going through that where you were you were almost like you had to fill that void there was a void in your life where you're like i don't want my script to be the kid that was a bitch or got knocked out and i'm gonna base it on all these things if you were to go back and have a conversation with you right after that fucking happened is there anything that you would tell yourself as a freshman in high school that you would help you heal through that process and maybe you didn't have to go through that shit in high school I would imagine that it's very similar to a lot of the unlifted stuff that we do now. Um, you know, this is a part of your story. This is not your story. That, yep. Yeah. I mean, we get these cornerstone moments in our lives, right? And then we just, we consciously or unconsciously make the decision that this is who I am now. And it's not accurate. We're malleable. We can change in a moment. So what my story became was, all right, I was, or I, I, now everyone else thinks that I'm a, I'm a bitch. I'm weak. So I need to go out of my way to show them that I'm not. So how do we do that? Well, we 
become an asshole. We start to say a lot of really mean things. And I like for accuracy, it wasn't like I did not become the bully, which happens to a lot of guys, yeah. right? They get bullied. I mean, we see it right now. Social media is the prime example. Hurt people, hurt people. People who got bullied all their lives now want to be the bullies. It wasn't that far for me. I just became a guy that I would not want to hang out with. I was a dick. I had this uh, unauthentic, inauthentic level of hubris. And I walked around with a big chest. Right? It wasn't quite like the invisible lat syndrome, but it was pretty <laughs> fucking close. <Yeah. laughs> and it made connection difficult. So one of the things that I learned about myself recently was, is that connection piece. And that was one of the hardest lessons for me was, uh, you are entirely responsible for the, the person that you are today. Because you get to decide what your story means about you. It was one of the best questions Mark England asked me, right? When we went through the level one is, all right, cool. So what does this mean about you? Oh, shit. Okay. I'm the one who created in my imagination what that meant about me. I didn't have the tools to articulate that right. at 13, 14, 15 years old. So having gone through that process and then saying, you know, you were, you showed up like a dick, you were, you know, you could be an asshole to, to certain people. Was there a specific moment, you know, as you kind of went through that, where you took a step back and you're like, man, I don't want to be this anymore. Or was it more just a steady progression of you had this moment where you saw yourself in a certain way, or you learned something from someone. So was it this stamp in time moment or was it more of a gradual progression to get to where you are now? Yeah, it was a progression for sure. There was no cornerstone moment for me that happened. That was like, Hey, um, that, that caricature needs to change. What it was, was a, a, the ramifications of a bunch of bad decisions. Yeah. Now you get faced with, you, everybody gets that, many people, maybe not everybody, many people get these moments in their lives where it's the fork in the road. You can take this path and you probably have a pretty good idea of where this leads, soft talk acknowledged, right? Or you can decide that something needs to change and I'm going to go this way and I'm going to see what's over here. Now the scary part about that is that's unknown. And making the change is hard because you don't know who you're going to be on the other side of that thing. This is why people stay in relationships that they don't love. This is why people cultivate careers that they're not passionate about. And this is why people get bitter and twisted over time is because they're more comfortable with the hell that they know than the heaven that's slightly uncertain. Yeah. Yep. I love that. That was a beautiful statement. Yeah, right we're going to we're gonna pull that clip right there. Yeah. I, I'm, before we move on to, you know, you were um, after um, going into college to play football and then moving on to choose a different sport when you went to Western Michigan. Just to close the loop on your experience um, growing up and in school, I'm fascinated by the whole, you had mentioned, you know, that there, there's a big age difference between siblings, right? So now you're a part of this blended family. Um, coming from a situation where I am, you know, I'm divorced, I have three children. Um, the woman that I'm dating has two children of her own that are, you know, in, in high school. And the process of two families kind of coming together, what, what was that like from your perspective, you know, having a younger sibling, 12 years younger than having, you know, a, a part of this blended family, someone who's older, what was that like in your development as a, as a man? My older brother, one of my older brothers became the model for me for who I needed to be as an adult, because uh, my parents, like I said, they got divorced when I was around uh, four and a half or five. So my father, uh, we saw him every other weekend. We lived with my mother primarily, got to see him some of the time. So my older brother, one of them, the one that I ended up going into business with at Fortitude Strength, uh, became the model for me of what an adult male was supposed to be. This became uh, a whole slew, it created a whole slew of its own problems because uh, negation acknowledged, my older brother is not the type of man that you want to model your behavior after. So did that, my younger brother is four and a half years younger than I am. So he's the closest one to me. Uh, having the older siblings, it affected slightly, but they were so far removed. Like they were only around when I was maybe zero through five or six. 
you know, from then on, it was just me and my little brother. And the problems that were created in that relationship was that living with my mother, um, I became, uh, I was given the role when I was, when I should not have been the role of being the, the enforcer in situations. Hey, he's not listening. Go make him listen. How old were you when that was the case? How was, how old were you when that was happening? All my teens. Yeah, we actually, my little brother and I uh, ended up getting into a fight when I was uh, 17. So I was a senior in high school and he was 12, which got me kicked out of the house living with my mother. And I got to go live with my father for about six, six, six months or so. And that had, that was a pivotal, another pivotal moment for me. It created a deep, meaningful relationship with my father that I never had before. We carried that relationship on until his passing, and uh, you know my father died as my best friend. It's um it's and, interesting, Cody. That um I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, go ahead. That you 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 have this experience in high school where you get knocked out or you get knocked out, knocked out cold, right? And so now you're trying to rewrite the script of you know I'm this you know this fucking tough guy. I'm not going to back down. And at the same time, you're given this leverage at home in this autonomy at home like you are now the enforcer of making sure your younger brother followed suit so i mean it, it it was only a matter of time for you to get to that point like yeah my fucking shit doesn't stink because i have this level of like authority at home that most 14 15 year olds are not the enforcer of disciplinary consequences for younger siblings and of course you took that into your life like yeah that's right i'm gonna fucking do this in school as well yeah and i mean my mother is a beautiful human being and she has her own list of problems. You know, she has, she's diagnosed bipolar and has depression, which we didn't know at the time. Yeah. This came after the fact, but you know, there would be, uh, it would be go solve this problem. And then immediately after, Oh my God, what did you do? That's not your role. Don't do that. Right. And it was like, yeah, what the, yeah. what the fuck, man? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Like stuff that happens to us that like as we go through these traumas as kids, ad adverse childhood experiences, we don't recognize it at the time how pervasive it is. It impacts us as adults in our relationships. You you had mentioned that your older brother was your role model, and that's what you envision a man should be, should look like, sound like, like that's what it should be. But you were you were basing it on things that you didn't feel were were strong and solid. Um, what do you think they should be? What should an adult male after you know going through that experience what should they be like what what would do you wish you had almost that's a good question so i went through the strong coach uh with bledsoe and i went through uh that three-month process and the culmination of that was a program that i created for men called valor so i, I love words right i've always yeah. been big on words fortitude is one of them you know, fortitude is the definition is uh, the mental ability to overcome adversity, bear pain with courage. Right? We shorten that down to one's ability to overcome adversity with grace and courage. So a man should have fortitude. He should be able to see a challenge and adversity and say, OK, even though I'm scared. Right. Because that's courage. Right. Courage is not the lack of fear. Courage is noticing fear and doing the thing anyway. So, yes, even though I'm scared, even though I don't know what's on the other side of this, I'm going to do it. He should almost relentlessly pursue his own growth and development because stagnation breeds disease. Stagnant water festers. Flowing water, for the most part, unless there's a dead animal upstream, you can drink flowing water. But if you come across a lake or a pond, you better proceed with caution. So he has fortitude. He's relentlessly pursuing his own growth. And he is attempting to improve his ability to communicate with himself and with those around him. The communication piece has been huge for me, and I still struggle with it. I mean, going through and lifted, right? We learn a lot about ourselves. We learn about our stories. We learn about how our language uh, influences us for good and for bad. 
I have not been a world-class communicator for most of my life. Historically, what I would do is in conflict or in an adverse situation is I would internalize that. I'd internalize it, I'd hold on to it, and then uh, that would, it creates the bitter and twisted, right? So now something happens, I don't share it. I decide that it creates the story about who I am in time and space. And I let that frame my reality. I let that become the lens at which I look through the world. When you have these adverse experiences and the traumas like you had talked about, that can be a problem. Makes relationships very difficult. One of my biggest challenges has been cultivating deep and meaningful relationships. The reason that's been a challenge for me, um, which I've had an experience recently that created some light and some space for me to understand this is um, I'm very self-critical. So in, in Lifted, we talk about something called the Billy story. Right? So the Billy story is essentially your inner evil workout partner. What's his name? How does he influence you? What do you do? So I'm very self-critical. What this, what I do with this criticism is I project it onto other people and I mirror it back at myself. So even as we're having this conversation right now, unconsciously, I'm thinking I might not be doing a great job. They're under the assumption that I'm not doing a great job. Everybody who's listening to this is going to think that I'm not doing a good job. Holy shit, I suck. Those, those thoughts likely are entirely inaccurate. But because I'm assuming that you think I'm doing a bad job, I'm projecting my insecurity onto you, which is going to, which will over time make connection very difficult. It's the old, I can't, uh, I, I'm unable to receive love if I can't properly love myself. I got to tell you that Where does, the definition, Cody, about masculinity, I think I was going to say, I was hoping that tremendous. you wrote yeah. that. Yeah, that was, I mean, uh, Part of what we're doing here is is developing our own definition of, of what masculinity means. I mean, like the tr it's uh, uh, traits associated with being a man. What the fuck does that mean, right? It doesn't it doesn't truly mean anything because every the way that men show up is so different depending on your your past, your situation, your family experiences. But to say to succinctly define it in a way where you talk about that fortitude, just that word, and I love just. The word fortitude is such a powerful word. And then just this pursuit of personal growth and development that you're not letting anything stand in your way. You want to be the best you you can be. And part of that is like constantly growing. You don't want to be staying there or, or stand still. You always want to be moving forward. And then within that, you know, healthy, positive communication. So I, I really feel like you're you're hitting it on all aspects. When, whenever we ask that question, it's always interesting to see or to so hear everyone has people. something a little different and i also love when you were talking about um how we think about like our like our thoughts right about conversations and when you're you start to project that when you think it right so you're thinking that we're thinking you're doing a bad job and then you know you're end up after that doing a bad job it ends up almost coming true like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that you have because you're thinking that you're nervous about it you're worried about it and you start to come off that way right what if you came in here and it was everything was going to be great and i was going to kill it and you were very confident that's how what energy you would exude when you were on the podcast so that makes so much sense to me that's like because i've noticed that in my life so often yeah. of how i show up um, and how I think about how I'm going to show up dictates normally how I'm going to show up. And meanwhile, at the end of the podcast, we're going to be like, dude, that guy was fucking awesome. Yeah, I know. Like, I, I, and I was just thinking, that. I was like, I was like, are you actually thinking that, dude? Because you're giving us gold right here. I was like, I hope. Absolutely. <laughs> so negation acknowledged. I do not think that. Yeah. <laughs> so now, so you, you go, you, you said you played um, college football at a small school mm -hmm. and then shifted and went to a, a larger school and you wound up playing rugby so uh truth be told i never said this on the podcast i don't think julie ever said when i had her on as a guest um my girlfriend actually played rugby at delaware um they yeah. actually her her group started a women's rugby team and they wound up going undefeated so i i first have to ask you if you ever had to shoot the boot does that uh yeah 
So what is that? What does that actually mean? She's gonna love this that we talked about shooting the boot. So what is what is shooting the boot? So shooting the boot is something that typically happens uh, for us anyway. So I'll speak from our experience. It happens at the social event that comes after the fact. If you have a good game or you score your first try, you dump a beer into a shoe and you drink it. That's shooting the boot. Then in, uh, in sports, we call our cleats boots. Yep. Right. And so there was another level, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong. Was there something that you had to pour the beer down someone's ass crack to? Did that ever happen? Is that part of it as <laughs> <No>. well? <laughs> then, uh, maybe it was just Julian and fucking. Maybe Delaware. only in Delaware. I don't know. Who Delaware that sounds some Delaware. That's some Delaware shit. I don't. Right there. Like they, to, to get the beer into the boot, they would pour it down someone's ass crack. If you fucked up one of the one of the cheers or one of the the um, toasts, if you chan- if you fucked up a toast. I never had to do that thing. Man, you lucked out. Call. Yeah. Oh, that's good. They got into some weird shit. Down yeah. There. That. So there was a kid. <laughs> so there was this kid that I knew, and there was like um, these people that I knew had this boot. Like they had boots that everybody would just wear. It was like the collective boots. If you needed to go out and you were working or something like that, you just wear those boots. So there was a girl over one time, and we were playing beer pong or something. And if she lost, she had to drink a beer out of the boot. So she drinks a beer out of the boot. She was in the hospital. She had to go to the hospital. She had like parasites in her. Oh my god! Like she almost died. (laughs) It was like really bad. So I'm just like, I don't think I'll ever drink out of a shoe. (laughs) Let's let's come up with that. Let's let's together. Let's say we won't ever do that. All right. That's the only thing worse than the stagnant water is drinking alcohol out of a out of a work 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 boot. boot. <laughs> getting yourself a parasite yeah. right yeah there we go That's so how you want to go out going through that experience you had mentioned um as we were talking before we started recording about that's where you started to learn this idea of like teamwork camaraderie community um going through western michigan is that where you decided okay i want to get into the space more in the line aligned with physical fitness and crossfit and did that was that where that shift happened in your life those things had always been present, you know, I mean, I, not always. Uh, so growing up, like physical fitness was never a value of our, of our home, right? Like I said, my mom worked very, very hard. My father worked on his property. But uh, the end of the day, the idea was I'm going to rest because I need to recover for the next day. It was negation acknowledged. I didn't, we didn't grow up with our parents telling us that exercise was important. What made it important was sport. Right. If you wanted to be a good football player, what what had you better be doing over the summer? You better be lifting your ass off. You better be lifting. You better be hitting the weight room. Right. So at 12 years old, that was my first experience with a barbell. I've been it now 20 years later. Right. I carried that through most of my life. Most of the time, there's been stints and periods here and there where I was not uh, negation acknowledged. I wasn't as involved in health and fitness. Right. And in hindsight, those times were some of the most difficult because there wasn't an appropriate expression of energy. Now, human beings were energy. We're energy by nature, right? There's the old, uh, you're stardust, right? So we're energy. We're vibrating on a certain frequency uh, in time and space relative to everything else. I believe that we need to express energy. This is why people need to cry. They need to lift. They need to laugh. It's the old, I told somebody else this, you know, restless leg syndrome. I think restless leg syndrome, if it's not a byproduct of medication, is a bunch of bullshit. What your body is telling you is that you've been sitting on your ass for eight hours today. You came home, sat on it for another three or four, and you laid down, and now it's going, I need to move. So your legs fidget at night. We are energy. We need to express that. So the lifting thing has been a way for me to do that. Now, I found CrossFit at the end of my college career. You know, and I found CrossFit as another mode of competition. I came from playing sports. I very much enjoyed the competition aspect of it. And I needed something to fill that space and for me to uh, get out my competitive energies. So I started competing in the sport of fitness. Not at, not at a high level, but locally. You know, and we did, we did well at some of the local competitions that we went to. And that's, that's what was the original draw for me. Now, what I later learned as I'm doing this more self-exploration and learning these things about myself is 
the same reason that I was drawn to CrossFit to be an expression of my competitive energies became the same problem that is toxic for most people who get involved in it. Because many of those people, they're using it to fill a space within themselves that they haven't properly addressed on their own. So what do we want to do? We want to go to the gym and we want to hurt. It's not a good workout unless what happens? Unless you're fucking banged up the next day, sore as hell. <laughs> unless I'm rolling around on the floor, unless I'm dying. And this was a trend that I started to notice as I got involved in the coaching side of it, the people who were most drawn to this thing, they wanted to hurt. They wanted to physically dominate their body, which led me to the whole, you know, fortitude strength, this the affiliating from CrossFit a couple of years ago. And we kept the one in, in Angola. We kept the one in Angola because we are able to dictate what CrossFit means. We're the first gym and we're the only gym. So we get to decide this is what CrossFit means. Here's the culture. Let's go. CrossFit had existed around here in this town since like 2009. That's a lot of history. And I didn't step in until 2015. So there's a lot of history there now and a lot of things that could have been done better and lessons that could have been learned sooner that, uh, I now had to hold this space for something that I became less passionate about over time. I was always passionate about fitness, helping people. I love the person who wants to come in and wants to increase their athletic performance. And I love the person who wants to come in and they want to save their own life because their, their doctor told me you better get your shit together. You're going to be on medication. I'll work with you both because you're coming with the understanding that this is going to be hard. It's going to be hard and it's going to take work. Now, for those people who like to come in and dominate themselves, the hardest thing for them to do is take a rest day, is to do self-care. Yeah. It doesn't change the fact that it's hard and that you need to do it. So this is where coaching is valuable in my perspective. It's, it's interesting. Um thinking about competing growing up you know you go through middle and high school sports playing college sports and I know for me that was such a driving force in my life even watching sports just having that competitive need met and then all of a sudden once you stop playing there's this huge void that happens you know where it's almost like you lose a portion of yourself when you stop competing so I look at CrossFit in a way where you know, it, it definitely provided an opportunity for guys that could just walk in off the streets. They didn't have to be skilled in a specific area. They were just like, you know what, I can work. I could work. I could work hard. But I think it's the, the trick is finding a way to do it. And it's not, um, you're not going to hurt yourself. And it could be something where you're competing against yourself. And, and maybe that's what we need to aspire to, to or find a way like where we're not identifying <clears throat> by it either, you know, finding that difference between using it as your, to get out your competitive energy, but also, it's okay. That's not who you are. You know, the way that I always looked at lifting mm. too, growing up playing sports. And I, I, right when I got out of college from playing football, then I wanted to do powerlifting. So that was it. How much weight is on the bar? Cool. So I identified by how much weight I could lift for like three or four years after that. That was the only thing I cared about. And now that I'm getting older again, I almost, <laughs> I got this old man next to me, but, uh, I, who, who gives a crap? You know, I had to. So I, it like you were talking about with the person with the rest days, I cut down from lifting five, six, sometimes seven days in a row. You know, I would just keep going and going. I would do something in the gym to now I'm lifting three days a week and that and now I'm doing yoga on other days and I'm doing stuff I'm uncomfortable with doing because I'm not feeling that pump or that same, you know, all my muscles are broken down. I can and I'm walking like Bambi the next day. Like that's how I did a good workout. But it's not, and I feel so much mentally stronger now than I've ever felt and more refreshed and more, you know, in the moment and versus just, and the other thing I was going to say is like music too. I don't know if you've had this, but like I was listening to like some, like I wouldn't play that in front of anybody, the shit I was listening to. Like, it's like death metal, <laughs> crazy music. And I, the other day I was listening to, um, 
it was like this piano song. It was an instrumental piano song. And I'm like in this calm state and just like, I, it's so different my experience now than it was five years ago, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah well, there's a word, right? If we're talking about the power of words, there's yeah. one word that, uh, that we use when we're young that we carry into things like powerlifting or, uh, or CrossFit specifically. Right? We call ourselves, what do we call ourselves? Call ourselves athletes. Yeah. So what does an athlete by nature do? He competes. So we now we've created this, we've taken this word, this, this simple word athlete, and we've started to create some belief around this. So I create a belief. Now I've got this belief. This is the type of person that I am. I start to engage in the behavior. Here's the behavior. Here's the things that an athlete does. What does an athlete do? They push themselves real hard and they compete. What does that single word ultimately become then? It becomes a piece of my identity, which is what you were alluding to, Anthony, right? When I stepped away from competition, I felt like I lost that piece of myself. We create these, we like to distill things down. And by we, I mean human beings. We like to make things very easy for us to understand and process and digest. So I've whittled myself down to a single word, which is an athlete. That athlete is now who I am in time and space. Many people leave their athletic endeavors and they feel like there's this hole now. There was so much of me. Now, all right, so I've let this word come a belief. This belief influenced my behavior. This behavior influenced my identity. What other words are we using here that create similar patterns? I love the word athlete. I put it on the back of my shirts still because I want people to identify as athletes because athletes not only compete, but they also take care of themselves. If we're talking about high level athletes here, right? They do the things that athletes are supposed to do, which is the things that 90% of people don't do. They take care of their body. They eat well, they get sleep, they manage their stress. Oh yeah. And they exercise. Cool. Yep. Let's do all of those things. Yeah. So the people that you're working with through um, both the uh, Fortitude Strength, the CrossFit Angola, and the Enlifted program, how do you how do you take that and, and make it work all together in harmony? You, you know, you have this this physical fitness background and this CrossFit background, competitive background, but then also using the words and helping people rewrite the stories that they're they're telling them themselves. How do you make that work in a you know harmonious way with your clients? You make it as approachable as you can for them where they're at. Different people require different things or want different things. One of the easiest ways to interject some language is with goals. What's your goal? What would you like to get out of this thing? When I ask most people that, I would, I would wager to say most people say something to the effect of, well, I want to lose 20 pounds, or I don't want to be fat. I don't want to be weak. I don't want to be on medication anymore. I want to get rid of X, Y, Z. So what are we doing by thinking about all of the things that we don't want? Just creating like a negative cycle there, like that negative thought process. We're training our reticular activating system, your RAS, your brain's filter, right? I'm sure that you guys talked about this with Mark. This is, this is the thing that tells your brain out of all of the millions of pieces of information that I'm taking in in a single moment, here's what's most important to me. If you and I are driving down the road together and I say, hey, Dennis and Anthony, don't find a red car. What are you going to do? Finding every damn red car out there. <laughs> Every single one. And you will likely not see any other color. So if I say I don't want to be fat, I don't want to be unhealthy, I don't want to be on medication, what am I focusing on? I'm focusing on the outcomes that I do not want. So if we're talking health, fitness, and how to change the way that your body looks, feels, and performs, one of the easiest ways we can do this is, okay, when we're talking about our goals, what do you want? Well, I do want to be healthy. I do want to have energy to play with my kids. I do want to enjoy the way my body looks, feels, and performs. I love when people say I want to lose weight. I was like, lose weight, really? Like you lost your wallet? Are you just going to 
find it next summer, you're going to pull out a pair of pants and you're going to find it like a $20 bill. No, you're not losing weight. You're making decisions for your body to be happier, healthier, and you're improving your body composition. Sweet. So now we start to interject, all right, what do, what do you want with something like goals? And then, you know, going back into the language things, projections and reflections. Many people who say that they want to get involved with health and fitness will project onto something outside of themselves for why they cannot. Well, I'd like to start going to the gym, but my kid's schedule makes it too difficult. Cool. So if this is the story that you're creating in your imagination, that if it wasn't, if it just wasn't for my damn kid's schedule, I could finally be healthy again. What sort of relationship are you cultivating with your children? Now it's their fault that mommy doesn't feel good, she doesn't look good, and she doesn't look good about the way that she feels. Or she doesn't feel good about the way that she looks, rather. My husband keeps bringing junk food into the house. Or my wife makes it too difficult for me to live a healthy lifestyle. Is this accurate? Most of the time it's not. But what have we gotten really comfortable with? We've gotten really comfortable blaming something other than ourselves for why our, why our lives are not the way that we would like them to be. Because it's easier. It requires no fortitude and it requires no ownership. Absolutely. So we, think, think about it this way too. Like what, even just the word but. Once, once that word is said, like we did a podcast um, a while back. The guy's name was Ryan Durstein, and he's a um, local guy, um, former MMA guy, worked at the Special Olympics. And part of it was, in the title, was ign ignoring everything after the butt. Mm -hmm. Because all that is is it's, it's, it's taking any personal ownership and responsibility away, and, and you're using that word to push that problem onto either someone else or some other situation and scenario and, and you know, uh, take all the responsibility away from yourself. So that, uh, that really resonated with me, just the, that word in particular, but. Take it and switch it, you know, and then lift it, take it and switch it to and. The other thing that but does is it negates everything that came before it. All right, so if I say, hey, guys, I've really enjoyed this experience, but I'm not sure how it all, I'm not sure that we should publish this thing. Right. What's the only thing you're going to remember? Oh, that motherfucker doesn't want to publish this <laughs> right. episode. Yeah. Yep. It's amazing. Take out but, use the word and. Watch how things change for you. You know what? My husband or my wife makes it difficult, but I think I can overcome it by having a conversation with her. Okay. Got it. What if we do this instead? I make it difficult and I think I can overcome it by having a conversation with her. What did we just do? We took all the ownership back, which what does ownership give us? It gives us the ability to change the outcome. If it's on my wife or it's on my kids or it's on my environment, good luck changing anything. You have no control. Yeah, and you're able to take the power back. You're able to take that responsibility. And and then it's it's freeing for you. And then also, it, whatever that relationship is, if you're putting it on someone else, when you talked about communication with another person, it's also pushing your shit onto them. And it's going to create this resentment in the future. So now it's my responsibility that you're not in better shape. That's my fault that you're not in shape. So th when you think about the, just the layers of that and just the, what we're telling ourselves, those sentences that we're, we're telling ourselves, if we're more, more cognizant of, of those words, it will not only improve our relationship with ourselves, but also with loved ones, with significant others, with a myriad of other people, just by the words that we're choosing to use. Everything gets better. Yep. And then, I mean, finally, you get those, those, those conversations that we all have with ourselves in our head. Right? Those conversations that we have in the middle of a tough workout. You can see the moment. You can see the shift. 
when somebody starts to tell themselves, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be here. This is too hard for me. Because we know that words, the stories, they affect four things, right? They affect our breathing, our imagination, our feelings, and finally, our posture. I can tell you an exact moment in most workouts when somebody gives up on themselves. Because what do they do? <sighs> drop their head, they slouch their shoulders. As a coach, that's the point in time when I go over to them and I say, hey, what's the story right now? They're like, this is really hard. I said, sure, this is really hard and you're really strong. It's not about all sunshine and rainbows. Negation acknowledged. It's not about, it's not about pretending that difficulty and adversity doesn't exist. It's about using our language to acknowledge that we have control in the way that we respond to these external stimulus in one way, shape, or form. We can create whatever we want out of that. We get to create the meaning, and then we get to create, uh, we get to create our response to the, to the action. In your work right now, um, with both Fortitude and, and the CrossFit Angola, are you are you taking on clients virtually, or is it is it just a face to face capacity? We do most of our work one on one. Yeah, I have I have clients that now I work with uh, only on language that we do meet over Zoom okay. or we meet uh, over phone call. So how can how can we find you then? How could the people that are listening on the Building Men podcast, how could they reach out to you and um, hear your message and, and connect with you? The easiest way is uh, Coach Cody Ringle on Instagram. Awesome. Hit, hit me up there, drop a DM, check out the gyms uh, if you're local or if you're interested in the, the fitness, the language, all that game. Let's chat. Love it. Brother. This is great, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I was awesome conversation. I'm just thinking back to the people that I've coached and hearing your conversations with them and exactly the conversations I've had with people and how much of it like this teaching this to coaches who are in a gym setting, I think is so important. And I think that message needs to get out more than ever, because I know so many coaches that are out there, personal trainers that again, they're just feeding into this never ending cycle from hell and not helping these people, honestly, um, cause I just hear those words in my head now that people have told me my clients over the years, and this would have been helpful to know beforehand, yeah. you know? So I was awesome. I really appreciate the time. I appreciate you guys. And, uh, you, did I hear accurately? You're getting started to start the, uh, enlifted certification. We are October 6th is the, uh, the, the time this, this episode airs, we will have, we'll be in, in the thick of it. We'll be in the in the throes of it. So we'd love to have you back on the podcast after going through that process. Yeah. Um, and even just the way that we're, you know, communicating on the podcast, the language that we're choosing to use. Um, it's almost like the emperor's, you know, robe or whatever. Like when you we, finally we, see shit and you're like, Oh my God, this is how I've been talking for such a long we time. We have all these enlifted coaches yeah. on and now I'm, I'm like, I know they're secretly di dissecting my language as I'm talking, yeah. my posture. And immediately you said posture, and I was like, oh, shit. It's so funny you say that. Every time someone says and, uh, breath work, I'm like, yeah. like I make sure I to take a breath, I'm standing belly up. belly breath. Or yeah. <laughs> every, without fail, I do that every single time. <laughs> That's hysterical. So, um, yeah, we'd love to have you back on in the future, and you know, I'm sure we'll meet in person at some point down the road as well. To the, um, to the listeners on the Building Men podcast, you can find us, building.men on Instagram, buildingmencoach at gmail.com. Um, if you haven't done so already, consider uh, leaving a review, five star review. If you think it's worth five stars, I don't know. I felt like we gave whatever you some review content you want. today. I, I, yeah. You know, I mean, there was the beginning with the umbrella saving story. Just for that stats story. along with it. If nothing else, I mean, the stats. The stats were the stats were big. Stats are always big. Um, Cody Ringle, thank you so much, my friend, for being on the podcast. Really uh, enjoyed getting to know you today. Looking forward to our continued relationship in the future. Um, go a step further than you thought you could go. We'll see you next time on. Building men.